Chapter 17 Just one. I want you to listen to me carefully. From your reference to places and names, I feel that you are looking and in search for someone. But this is a closely kept secret. If these names were ever revealed, you would get into serious trouble. I am in your power and will undergo any treatment you mete out to me. But if I reveal these names, your secret will be out and you too will suffer. Your action thus will solve nothing. But if you treat me with sympathy and try to understand my pain, I will keep your secret and do all in my power to help you. I can sense from your tense manner and speech that you carry a heavy burden in your heart. Why do you want to add to it? The chief became lost in deep thought. He is right. In my eagerness I have revealed more than I should have. If I am rough with him, he can destroy me. But as a friend, he can be of immense help. With a wry grin, he said to Jaswant, Young man, you are very sharp. All right, tell me your problem, problems and how I can help you. Jaswant says, I will tell you everything, but promise me that you will be my friend. Chief says, Yes, but only if you will help me. Jaswant, Can you tell me something about your problem? Chief says, No, not now, but if you decide to help me, then I will too. Jaswant says, I feel that your fear of trusting me is wrong. Chief says, Maybe. Jaswant says, Then you promise? Chief says, Do you know Nukro? Jaswant says, No. Chief says, I'll just come back. And he left. Jaswant sensed that a chief was overcome with emotion and he had gone away to hide his tears. After a short while he returned. The moon had risen and in its glow Jaswant could see that the chief had washed his face. He appeared to struggle with some deep inner grief. Jaswant had realized that this young officer was the only one who could save him from exposure. It was almost daylight and the soldiers would begin their task soon. He offered up a fervent prayer. Vaheguruji, by your grace, let this man feel sympathy and help me, or save me in any manner you feel fit. Chief says, Young man, look at these and tell me what they are. Jaswant says, This one is a khanda, and this is a small kirpan. The chief says, Do sick children play with these? Jaswant says, No, children and adults all keep these with them. The ones you have obviously belong to a child. They must have been made for a very made for a very loving mother because the metal quality is excellent. Chief says, and what is this? Jaswant says, this is the morning prayer of the Sikhs. Chief says, is it Jap Nisan? Jaswant says, yes, and it is beautifully written. Quickly, Jaswant turned the pages and found written on the last page written by Shatrujit Singh for his devoted wife, Askar. Jaswant says, You are a Muslim. What use are these to you? The chief says, taking them back. They are of use. Now tell me, what have you decided? Jaswant says, promise me first. Chief says, you are not the one with the stolen diamond, are you? Is that why you want my help? Jaswant says, no. Chief says, All right, I promise in the presence of my Allah that I shall be true and a loyal friend to you. Now you must make a vow. Jaswant says, I vow as a Sikh to be your true friend and guard your secrets. Chief says, I have heard that Sikhs are truthful, but still I want you to confirm that you are swearing by your God. Jaswant says, When a Sikh takes an oath as a Sikh, It automatically means that his God is a witness because Sikhs always live in the presence of their Allah. Chief says, Very well. Tell me now, what do you want from me? Jaswan says, That I should not have to undergo the physical search. Chief says, Why? Jaswan says, I hate any strangers touching my body. Chief says, Right. But where is the harm? Jaswan says, Under normal circumstances, no. But I have taken a vow. 
You don't need to worry that I am the diamond thief. If you don't believe me, I am ready to give my garments for your soldiers to check. The chief was puzzled and said, I still can't see the problem, but if this is all you that you want me to do, then I can only offer one suggestion. Come with me and change into the clothes of my groom and get busy looking after my horse. As a part of my staff, you will not arouse suspicion. Then nodding to Jaswanth, he moved away. Jaswanth, who, as we know, was none other than Satwanth Kaur, disguised as a male, quickly woke up the old Baba and whispered, I have to go for a couple of days, but I shall definitely meet you the day after. Meanwhile, please don't worry and don't try to look for me. And with a reassuring smile, he followed the chief. On reaching the chief's tent, Jaswan quickly changed into the clothes of the psyche with the groom, and folding his own into a neat pile, he kept them aside. The chief was already convinced of Jaswan's innocence, but the casual way he changed his clothes made his belief more certain. Satwant Kaur's life had taken many twists and turns. From being the beloved daughter of doting parents, she was kidnapped and sold in the marketplace. Suffering the pain of imprisonment, she went on to create an atmosphere of friendship and satsang. She lay sleeping on a bed of hay beside the horse, whose caretaker she had now become. The chief, whose name was Aga Khan, completed the round of the camp and dropped onto his bed, tired out physically and emotionally. His mind was in turmoil. Though he felt relieved at finding someone to help him, he could not be sure how further to trust him. With the dawn, the rest of the travelers were searched thoroughly, and when nothing was found, Aga Khan asked for the Amir's permission to leave. They received this towards the evening, as the thief had been arrested in the palace itself. Due to the lateness of the hour, it was decided that the caravan would depart early next morning. Chapter 18 That night there was an air of celebration in the camp. Everyone, everyone went cheerfully about the tasks of cooking, eating and settling down to sleep. The travelers were eager for the dawn when finally the signal for departure would be given by the beating of the Nagara. At a little distance from the camp, Aga Khan sat in a troubled mood. In front of him sat Jaswant Singh. Aga Khan said, So Jaswant Singh, tell me what was the secret which you were trying to hide. Jaswant Singh said, To be frank, Khan Sahib, though we have vowed to be true friends, it does not include revealing all one's secrets. You will have to win my trust by showing your complete trust in me, if you want to know my secret. I reiterate that I will keep my faith with you and help you in every way I can. As to whether Sikhs keep their word or not, you can ask the Sikhs here, or the Pathans who have been to Punjab and have been dealing with the Sikhs. Aga Khan says, I know this for a fact, otherwise I would not have approached you. If you were not a Sikh, my lips would have been sealed. Chiswan Singh says, Then tell me how I can help you. Aga Khan says, hesitating for a while, then whispering, May Allah guide, you. May Allah guide me. I have been given the job of protecting this caravan and seeing it safely only up to Peshawar. What is troubling me is that I have a maidservant who nurtured me during childhood. She is in prison. Though she is innocent of any wrongdoing, I love her daily and I want to save her. We are leaving tomorrow and till now I have not been able to think of a way of rescuing her. I am sent, being sent on this trip so that she can be executed in my presence and no sign of her remains by the time I return. Just one Singh says, Which person has so much power that he can go against your wishes and order her execution. Aga Khan says, it's a long story, but the gist is that my maid knows some secret about my father and he is worried that she will reveal it to me. Also, my stepmother is against her and has had wrong, strong words with me about this. 
My father loves me dearly and cannot bear to be departed from me. He is sending me on this mission just to separate me from my nanny and to get rid of her during my absence. Ironically, I already know the secrets of my father. I already know the secrets my father wants so desperately to keep hidden from me. Just one Singh says, What caused the ill feelings between you and your stepmother? Aga Khan says, Must be my nature, which is very different from the rest of the family. <clears throat> I have in me aggression and killing, but have to maintain a false front. Also, my nanny has warned me against getting too close to my stepmother, whose show of love for me was quite false. Just one thing. That was asking for trouble. Anyhow, let's see. Aga Khan says impatiently, Yes, yes, what can we do now? Just one thing says, Is it possible for you to help her to escape? Aga Khan says, That is the least of my problems. The difficulty is to get her safely away. I don't have any confidence who can keep her in hiding, and I can't send her alone on the journey to Punjab. Khyber Pass is a most desolate and dangerous area. The tribes living in the mountains are like bloodthirsty animals who don't hesitate to butcher the lone traveler. Jaswant Singh says, Then you will have to bring her here, which you can do with the necessary security. Leave the rest to me. Aga Khan said, What will you do? Jaswant Singh said, Dressed in the male garb as a Sikh, she can act as our servant, who is looking after our luggage. I will take care of my companions and see that no one gets even a hint of this. Aga Khan said, If anyone gets news of this, I shall be torn to pieces. Just one thing says, How will any of this leak out? And if it does, you can tear me from limb to limb. But why do you underestimate your own authority and position? Who can be bold enough to question you? You must show confidence in yourself. It is good to think that think and plan, but it must be followed by strength and action. Aga Khan said, My loving father can be extremely harsh and hard-hearted. He has been to Hindustan eight or nine times. He has looted and plundered and killed innumerable innocent people. All this has turned him into a tyrant. Just one thing says, That is understandable, but you can show courage in your beliefs. When a person gets engulfed by problems, Sikhism teaches him that while on one side he must have faith in the Lord, on the other he must have confidence in his motives. He must never become disconsolate and apathetic. Aga Khan said, Yes, I see. So if I bring her, you will see her through? You guarantee this? Just one thing says, Vaheguru will help us achieve this. The only guarantee is the true promise made by a Sikh. At these words, Aga Khan jumped onto his horse and cracked the whip and rode off like the wind. Chapter 19 It was past midnight when Satwantkar heard the sounds of hoofs beats. In a short while, Aga Khan appeared, accompanied by a tall, slim woman. She seemed to be in her late forties. Unlike the Pathan women, her face was long and thin. Her eyes carried a hint of sadness in their depths, but they also showed the wisdom and gravity which come from facing tough and challenging situations. Just one Singh said, You've achieved this very quickly. Aga Khan says, Yes, with some help from Allah. She had managed to get out of the house yesterday and has remained hidden during the day. Now under cover of darkness, she had been making her way to this camp when I met her. She had an inkling of what fate awaited her after my departure, so she decided to act. Her absence must have been discovered by now, and I am sure my father must be sending guards here, since this is the only caravan ready for departure, and he knows this is her one chance of getting out of the country. So just one thing, it is now time for urgent action. Jaswan Singh nodded and leaving Aga Khan to escort the woman to his tent, he quietly went to where his luggage was kept. He took out his second set of clothes and brought them for the woman to change into. Then he took her back with him and waking up the old Babaji, he explained, Aga Khan has ordered that we take this man along as our servant, but we must 
keep it a secret. I have promised Aga Khan, and you must help me, the old man agreed. With the breaking of dawn, Aga Khan's ferocious father came galloping up along with his guards. He put on a great show of affection for his son, and told him that he had wanted to meet him once again before he left with the caravan. While they sat talking, the guards quietly infiltrated the camp and carefully checked everyone. The people were becoming impatient to leave, so Aga Khan took his father's permission and gave the signal for the caravan to move on. The guards stood lining the road, and as the people passed by, they sharply scrutinized each one of them. Jaswan Singh and the maid, too, walked by, talking and laughing in a relaxed manner. The guards were unable to gauge that these were women in disguise. Aga Khan's father now embraced his son one final time and turned back. But he left a few of his spies to go with the caravan, in case the maidservant managed to join it at some later stage. With a heart full of trepidation and also of thankfulness and joy, Satwant at last set off for her homeland. As the caravan meandered over the difficulty of rocking terrain, Jaswant Singh got a chance to know Aga Khan's maid, whom they now called Sayanji. Aga Khan quickly spotted the four spies his father had sent and instructed his most trusted guards to keep watch on them and keep them well supplied with liquor. Only then he visited his Amma to see to her well-being. One day after the evening meal was over, Jaswant Singh and Sayanji sat talking. Sayan in this country, the people are not all Pathans. Scores of Hindus had been captured and brought here. Now they cannot be differentiated from the locals. Jaswan says, But how is it that they quietly accept this merging with the Pathan population? Sayan says, They are helpless. The threat of the raised sword is enough to keep them meekly complaint, compliant. Also, they have no hope of receiving any support from their homeland, and so they accept this inevitable. In this way, they, assure, they are assured sufficient food and escape from the fear of instant death. Just one says, that is true, but if they accept death, they can avoid a life of slavery. What is life worth without faith in one's religion? Sayan says, yes, I agree. I have seen that Sikhs are seldom taken prisoners, even when they are outnumbered. They prefer to die to die fighting. So far, I have not seen any sick man or woman who has agreed to give up his religion. Even though Sikhs are often of Hindu origin, a dramatic transformation takes place the moment they receive Amrit. You appear surprised at my words. Have you not heard about the sick young Sikh girl who has was recently captured by the Amir? The moment she entered his palace... She set her room on fire and perished rather than give up her faith. Surely you must have heard. Jaswan says, Yes, I have. In Punjab, the people take great pride that not even a child of theirs has been captured and enslaved by the Pathans. Either he has been killed or he managed to escape from his captors and reach back home. Sayan says, It's so true. Love of their religion burns bright and strong in their hearts. A sick infant can be brought up in a Muslim house, and for a number of years he can follow their path. But the moment he learns that he is from a sick family, it takes him no time to rush back to his original home and parents. Just one says, looking quizzically at Siam, How is it that even though you are a Pathan, you are so full of praise for the Sikhs? Siam says, I am merely stating the truth. The qualities of the Sikhs are such that even their worst enemies end up praising them. It is a well-known fact that Nadir Shah had attacked Punjab, shed rivers of blood and captured innumerable Hindu women. At Atok, Sikhs had carried out raids under cover of darkness and saved 2100 of these unfortunate women. Only one Sikh woman was captured and sent to Kabul along with some Hindu women a few days earlier. But the brave lioness that she was, she gave up her life, but not her religion. 
Jaswan says, Did you see her? Sain says, See her? I was with her. At these words, Sain's face became very pale with grief and tears began to flow from her closed eyes. Jaswan says, Please, don't cry. I did not mean to upset you. I don't want anything more. And Jaswan continued to reassure Sain till she could control her grief. Chapter 20 In the hilly region, when the wheat crop begins to sprout, there comes heavy snowfall. Till the spring season, these fragile plants remain under, lost under a thick blanket of snow. As soon as the sun begins to shine and the snow melts, the plants rear their heads, welcoming the light and warmth. With the removal of the oppressive cold, they begin to grow and flourish, so that within days they become tall and proudly carry the cobs of grain on their sturdy stalks. For Satwanth too, the events of the recent past had been as blightening as deep snow. She, who had been a cheerful and carefree child, became very serious and thoughtful. She learned to weigh each situation carefully before coming to a decision or taking any action. She believed in Chardikala. But circumstances had taught her to keep the concept deep in her heart and not show it on her face. It was this belief which had given her courage and fortitude. Those who practice Nam Simran react to life's adversities by becoming more introverted and by conserving their spiritual strength. At this stage, their actions are marked by thoughtfulness, patience and tolerance and there is a lessening of overt and carefree happiness. Satwant began to come into her own. Her smiling countenance spread cheer among her co-travelers. Sainji was especially charmed by her innocent nature and began to love her deeply, but had still not realized that Jaswant was, in fact, a girl. The caravan now reached the outskirts of Jalalabad, a town built on the right bank of Lunda, River Lunda. The weary travellers were delighted to see the picturesque scene as they set up camp. Towards the evening, Jaswant and Sain went and sat on the banks of the river. Jaswant recited the rare ras, and Sain listened with love and devotion, automatically standing up for Ardas and bowing down after its completion. Walking back to the camp, Jaswant smiled mischievously and said, My dear friend, you have become a kafir, means non-believer, today. Sain says, How? Jaswant says, You not only listened to the namaz, the prayer of a kafir, but also participated in it, and at the end even bowed to his khuda. Sain says, laughing, Oh, you thought that? I did not pray to either a kafir or a nomin god, but prayed with my dear Jaswant and bowed to his love and devotion. I have always looked for a living being on whom to shower my love. This has always been my puja and my ibadat. Those are modes of Hindu and Muslim worship. When I was a child, my father was my god. After marriage, my husband was the worshipped and I the worshipper. When he passed away within a year of our marriage, Aga Khan's mother became my deity, the center of my existence. Then after the death, I gave my complete devotion to Aga Khan. And now through him, I have come to meet and adore you. I do not know any namaz, rosas, or rosas. To me, the love of a beloved person is the only worship. These words were uttered with such sincerity and warmth that Jaswant's eyes filled with tears. Jaswant said, with a gentle laugh, This is a beautiful thought, no doubt, but I feel that Khuda's name must be taken with more respect and deference. Only love can help us reach our destination, and at every stage he himself is present. Those wise, enough so, those wise ones who travel on this path say it is becoming, to remain silent when thinking of him. He epitomizes love and is present everywhere, yet remains detached. You have a priceless gift of love in your heart. 
but where earlier this has been centered on your father, husband, mistress, and Aga Khan, a day will come when its focus will be the Lord. Sain says, It is difficult for me to change anything just now, because there has been too much of a gap. Maybe a day will come when the present situation has been resolved, then I will meet a saintly person who will remove all my negative qualities. I have been serving someone since a very long time, someone who is truly benevolent and forgiving. Jaswan says, My dear Sainji, I can't wait any longer. I am going to be rude enough to ask you, how long are you going to keep me in the dark and talk in riddles? When you love me so much, why don't you tell me the whole story instead of always changing the subject? If I had not known anything about the matter, I would have kept quiet. But I have heard some bits and pieces which I keep juggling in my mind to get a complete picture. I am not asking out of idle curiosity, but because I want to know and come closer to you. Chapter 21 At just once earnest words, Sain gave a long sigh and said, My dear, why would I hold back anything from you? But touching on painful subjects can only revive the suffering. Jaswan says, I know, but we have met under unhappy circumstances, and that has, in a way, brought us closer. I, too, have had my share of troubles. Sain says, I had a feeling that you were from Punjab and had been brought here as a captive. Jaswan says, Yes, that is right. I have managed to get my freedom after a lot of hardships. By God's grace and the kindness of your Aga Khan, I am hoping to reach my homeland. As he is a Pathan, I have not spoken very freely with him. But Sainji, it's not easy to keep secrets for long from those we love. Sain says, Barring some unforeseen calamity, I can assure you that my son will keep his word to the end. Jaswan says, I don't expect anything less from him or from you, my sweet Sainji. I feel there is not much difference in the blood coursing in your veins and mine. Sain says, Yes, I am neither a Pathan nor a Muslim. This appearance of mine has been created by love or laughing, maybe as a result of my actions in my previous life. Jaswan says, holding Sain's hand in a warmth clasp. I can't wait to hear your whole story. Please tell me. Sain says, I am the daughter of Punjab and the land of seven rivers. Though I belong to the Rajput clan, I was born in the hills of Punjab. My father was a big landowner. His name was Shaktu, and our hometown was Nadon. I was married at an early age, but within a short time my husband and my father both died. We were living in Lahore at the time. In our neighborhood, there lived a very cultured and dignified family. The lady of the house was a warm and caring woman. She took me under her wing after this tragedy and gave me so much love that I became like one of the family. So, dear Jaswantji, my blood is as pure as the waters of the Punjab rivers, and as such, you are like my own brother. And she took Jaswant in a tight embrace. Tears ran down her cheeks. Her breathing slowed, and she seemed to go into a trance. Jaswant says, after a while, Sain, beloved Sain, it's the Lord's gift that in this foreign, barren land I have met a sister whose love has banished my feelings of aloneness. If you can tell me the rest of the story, then my happiness will be complete. I am sure that Aga Khan too belongs to Punjab. The blood in his veins is full of vigor and strength, and not the harshness of this land. Tell me, sister dear, that I am guessing correctly. Sain says, Dear brother, it's a tragic tale, but listen, and I will try to answer all your questions. To continue... From where I had left off earlier, my mistress was the epitome of love and goodness, spreading cheer all around with her smiling face, singing Guru's Shabad in her beautiful sweet voice. Her husband was a strong man, truthful and religious by nature, ever ready to help. They made a truly unique couple. 
they had one daughter and then the Lord blessed them with a beautiful son. I have never known such happiness, not even in my father's house. After a pause, we used to get a lot of visitors and the mistress was always happy to receive them. So I spent more and more time looking after the little boy. I feel like crying when I remember those days of joy, service and satsang spent in that house. Misfortune had descended on the country with Aurangzeb's fanatical rule. He had sown the seeds of communal hatred, fear and suspicion. These began to bear fruit now. The person who ascended the throne after Aurangzeb was Muhammad Shah, an inept ruler. Too busy satisfying his lust for pleasure to give any thought to the country and the people. At this time, Nadir Shah began to invade with his savage hordes, completely devastating the land between Peshawar and Lahore. Rivers of blood flowed everywhere. Vast treasures of gold, silver and precious gems were plundered. Thousands of people were captured and taken back as slaves. Bands of Sikhs used to make frequent forays into the enemy camps, snatching back whatever wealth they could lay their hands on and rescuing thousands of young girls and women. When Nadir Shah reached Delhi, he asked about the Sikhs, and when he heard details about their valor and discipline, he commented to Baha Khan Bahadur, Handle them with care. It's quite clear that because of their qualities, they will rule the country one day. But who was there to heed his words, and he himself dealt with them with utmost savagery? During this time, we had to go to Patiala at the invitation of the Maharaja. Near Ludhiana, we encountered Aga Khan's Patan father, Hassan Khan, who was on his way to Delhi with the company of his soldiers. In no time, all of us were made prisoners, my master, mistress, the children and myself. That night when the Sikhs attacked, they managed to release my master and the little girl only. During our journey, Sikhs carried out raids numerous times on Hassan Khan's party, but to our misfortune, we remained in his clutches till we reached Kabul, bedrangled and tied together like animals. The sons and daughters of Parat were sold for a mere five rupees each. Hassan Khan was attracted by the beauty of my mistress and her son, so we were taken to his palace. Here he tried his best to make her take the Islamic vows so that he could marry her, but she, she refused to give in. Finally, Hassan Khan took out his sword and brandishing it in her face, threatened her, but she knew no fear. In a fit of rage, he lunged at her with a sharp blade and the next moment my most beloved mistress and friend lay dying on the ground. Her son sat crying beside her and I was in such a state of shock that I, all I wanted to do was to kill myself. Suddenly I heard a voice, weak and feeble, but clear enough for me to understand. She made me promise to take her care of her son, no matter what it cost me. Then she continued, When he is able to understand, then tell him about his origin and all that has happened. Tell him that I want him to go back to his country, become a Singh, and spend his life in the service of his nation and his pant. I leave this duty to you, and knowing that you will not let me down, I can now die in peace. That black night I spent crying bitterly and consoling the child. In the morning I picked up the boy and went to Hassan Khan and said, His mother is dead. What do you want to do with him? He asked in return. Will he accept Islam? Folding my hands, I said, He is a mere child. What does he know of such matters? But this I must tell you, that he belongs to a very rich and cultured Sikh family, and as such should be nurtured and not thrown away. At that moment, an odd thing happened. Hassan Khan turned to look at the boy, who smiled at him and lifted up his arms. The tough Pathan automatically bent down and picked up the child, murmuring, I was childless, childless. 
Allah has sent me this gift. From today, he is my son. He called his begum and put the child in her lap, but the boy would not stay in her arms. He kept crying and holding out his hands to me. Very politely, I said, Khan Sahib, I have looked after this boy since the day he was born, and he will not stay without me. If you kill me too, he will not be able to stand the shock and may die. Hassan Khan glared at me and harshly asked, Are you also a Sikhni? I replied, No, I belong to the hill regions. He said, Oh, not a very resolute then. Will you accept Islam? I thought to myself, My religion is love, and I must carry out the wishes of my benefactress. What have I to do with Hinduism or Islam? My duty is to love and care for this child. Any means adopted for that would become my faith. So I said, I am ready to do whatever you say. This pleased him immensely, but I requested them to see to the respectful disposal of my beloved mistress's body. After a long argument, they gave me permission to cast it into the nearby river. I took a sheet and carried her to the banks of the river reciting Vaheguru Vaheguru. I got her ready for her final journey, wrapped her in the sheet, tied a stone to weigh it down, and with a breaking heart said farewell to her. I had lost three beloved people and now had to take care of the fourth, all the time wondering what fate had in store for us. I became a Patani in a Patan household and won the trust of one and all as if I was a part of the family. All the time I continue to look after my young charge. So, my dear Jaswan Singh, this Aga Khan is closer to you than you think. He not only belongs to your country, but to your religion and your faith also. Chapter 22 Satwant had listened with bated breath, often with tears rolling down her cheeks or sobbing quietly. When Sain ended her story, she clung to her, saying, You are wonderful. You have not let my hopes down and confirmed that Aga Khan is not only a Punjabi, but a Sikh. Please tell me the rest. Sain says, There is not much more to tell. We spent about 17 years imprisoned in that life. I wanted to fulfill my promise to my mistress and tell Aga Khan about his origins. But I wanted to wait till he was mature enough to handle the situation. And you can see how well he has grown. His adoptive mother, Hassan Khan's wife, was a very good woman. She lavished a great deal of love and care on him and treated him very well too. Sadly, she died, and after some time, Hassan Khan married again, a young and beautiful woman. She had been hostile towards my child in the beginning, but recently her manner towards him changed, and she began to show him a lot of affection. My son is too innocent and trusting, but I could make out that this woman meant to harm him. She had a son from a previous marriage who used to live with her parents, but now she had brought him home. Her plan was to get rid of Aga Khan so that Hassan Khan would turn his love towards her son, thus making him his heir. Once I had understood her plans, I warned Aga Khan to be careful. But youth is generally careless, and so I began to be extra watchful on his behalf. One day I took him aside to warn him again, and in my haste I said, My child, you must give up your carefree manner and be more cautious. You can't trust these Pathans. He turned on me in surprise and said, What do you mean by these Pathans? Aren't you and I also Pathans? I gave a sheepish laugh and avoided answering. Then I got up and became busy with some chores. The next day, Aga Khan came to me and said, Mother, you are the most beloved person to me. Last night, I kept thinking about our talk and got the feeling that you were hiding something from me. I can't bear that there are secrets between us. This thought disturbed me so much that I couldn't sleep. I realized that the time had come to tell Aga Khan his mother's last words. I picked up his sword and, keeping it in front of him, said, 
Child, I am going to tell you something very important. I only ask that if you don't believe or don't like what I have to say, then you pick up this sword and kill me. But don't say anything against it. Taking this promise from him, I related all the incidents that had happened since his birth. As I talked, the effect on him was amazing. I had thought that a young man brought up in an alien land as a member of a noble family and immense wealth and status would react with disbelief and anger at my words. But it was exactly the opposite. As I told him about his origins, his mother's suffering and death, his first face turned red with anger. His eyes turned bloodshot and chewing his lip, he picked up his sword. I asked him, where are you going? To take a revenge on my mother's killer, he said. I pulled him by his hand and holding him in a close embrace, I said, your mother was an angel. She forgave her slayer before she died. What is of great importance for you is to carry out her wishes. He calmed down a little bit at my words, and two scalding tears rolled slowly down his cheeks. Then he asked, tell me, what were my mother's wishes? I replied, I won't tell you just yet. First you tell me that what you are planning to do. He said, that is simple. I shall kill Hassan Khan and go to Punjab to find my old father and assure him that his lion-hearted son has returned after avenging his mother's death. I replied, maybe he won't accept you. In our country, people don't eat meat and drink with Muslims. He said, won't my father keep me to cut grass and look after his horses? And what about my sister? Won't she allow me to sit in her doorway as a watchman? You have cheated me by keeping me in the dark and allowing me to grow up in a house of my mother's killer. I have eaten his food all these years. My life is cursed. At his bitter words, I burst out crying. He too was very agitated, moving restlessly all the time. Finally, he shook my shoulder and said, Mother, tell me what were my mother's instructions for me. I can't rest till I know. My blood is urging me to action. So I told him, There are no orders for you. They were for me to take care of you and to tell the whole story when you grew up. When she was sure that the moment you learned you were who you were, you would no longer stay here, but rush to join your people. This was her belief, and she told me to convey this to you. He said, yes, I will go to my country, but I will take the head of Hassan Khan on my spear and offer it to my father and ask for his blessings for avenging my mother's death. Very gently I told him, this will not please your mother, because she forgave Hassan Khan. Wasn't she a brave woman? he asked. I said to him, my child, you are not familiar with Sikhs yet. They are not wild people fighting randomly. They are spirited and brave people. They pray daily for Sarbatadakpala, meaning welfare of all. They are fakirs who try and remove the burden and misery of suffering of the world. They don't take revenge. They are without enmity. But they fight against all evil, tyranny and wrongdoing. In this way, when I told him some more about Sikhs, his anger faded and tears of grief began to flow from his eyes. I took out the kara and karpan, which I had hidden in my box, and gave them to him. I also handed over the gutka, which his father had written by hand and given to his mother. I told him that these were his mother's parting gifts to him. He took each item and touched it to his forehead with reverence. Then he said, in obedience to my mother's and your wishes, I shall not kill Hassan Khan, but I will not stay in this house. I warned him not to be hasty. Let some time pass and plan carefully. The road to Punjab is difficult and dangerous. We need to be cautious and circumspect now and not take any rash step. He gave in to my suggestions quietly and as we continued to talk, his agitation passed. 
Things continued the same way in the household, but Aga Khan's behavior towards his father and stepmother changed. They could make out that he was sad and preoccupied. Hassan Khan became suspicious that I might have revealed the secret to Aga Khan. He started spying on us whenever we sat talking. He could not hear very much, but his worry increased and finally he made plan to send Aga Khan out of the country and in his absence to put an end to my life. Jaswan says, Why did he want to kill you in this stealthy fashion? Sain says, Because he knew that if he did this in Aga Khan's presence, his son would pick up the sword against him in order to protect me. Aga Khan was happy to be going to Punjab with the caravan, but he was uneasy about leaving me behind. He was on his wit's end how to get me safely out. When, by Vaheguru's grace, he met you, and now here we are. They sat talking late into the night. Finally, Sain went to sleep, but Satwant still sat thinking. O oh Lord, what is wrong with our country? We have strength, but are unable to use it. The result is that my countrymen are captured and kept in such harsh circumstances. Yet our misfortune is that we don't awake to fight back these tyrants. Slowly all the past events and the tragic details of Askar and her son passed before Satwant's eyes. How long she sat thinking, she did not know. After a while her eyes closed and she too slept. Chapter 23 Prince Timur had reached Kabul. When Abdali learned that Marathas had come to Punjab, he became livid with rage and began to plan new attacks. Timur had left spies behind to bring in details of conditions in Punjab from time to time. When the caravan reached Jalalabad, Aga Khan met some of, the, of these spies who were on their way to Kabul with the latest reports. From them he learned that the Marathas had reached a talk and were manning the border. But throughout the country it was the Sikh units which were in control. Aga Khan felt thrilled that he was reaching his country in time to be of service. He would fight shoulder to shoulder with his compatriots, compatriots to ward off Abdali's invasion. Hassan Khan spies too returned to Kabul as they were satisfied that the old nursemaid was not with the caravan. Now Sain and Aga Khan could relax and meet openly. One day Sain said to Aga Khan, I have told everything about you to Jaswant. He too was brought here as a captive from Punjab. But I have not had the time to learn all the details yet. He was very grateful for your help. But now that he knows you are a Sikh, and Shatrujit Singh's son, he is overjoyed. He told me that your sister is alive and sings beautiful songs full of love and longing for her missing brother. Even though there has been no news about you for so many years, they have not given up, and the Sikh Jathas pray for your safety for you and your mother. Aga Khan says, Amma, it amazes me that the community into which I was born has so much love and concern for its members. After 17 long years, they still pray for the safe return of a young woman and her son and friend and keep sending undercover people to reach for them, to search for them, and all the time without losing hope. Alas, if only I had not been captured and taken away, I would have grown up in my own home eating sick food I would have been the support of my aged father and with drawn sword in hand. I would have been serving my panth on the battlefield. The first few years of my youth have been misspent in accepting enemies as friends and treating friends as enemies. Well, what is past is past. With God's grace, I shall try and make up for the lost time. Sain says, May Vaheguru grant you a safe return home. The community you belong to is so closely knit that daily each Sikh prayer for his brothers and sisters each Sikh daily prays for his brothers and sisters with these words. 
ਜਹਾਂ ਜਹਾਂ ਖਾਲਸਾ ਜੀ ਸਾਹਿਬ ਤਹਾਂ ਤਹਾਂ ਰਚਿਆ ਰਿਆਇਤ ਮੀਨਿੰਗ ਓ ਗੋਡ ਵਰਐਵਰ देयर ਆਰ ਦ ਮੈਂਬਰਸ ਆਫ ਦ ਹੋਲੀ ਖਾਲਸਾ ਐਕਸਟੈਂਡ ਥਾਈ ਪ੍ਰੋਟੈਕਸ਼ਨ ਐਂਡ ਮਰਸੀ ਟੂ ਥੈਮ ਅਲੋਂਗ ਵਿਦ ਪ੍ਰੇਅਰਸ ਈਚ ਸਿਕ ਰਿਮੇਨਸ ਐਵਰ ਅਲਰਟ ਟੂ ਬਿਕਮ to come to the help of anyone in distress but the prayers have a deeper meaning as through them they ask for divine help and guidance for their brethren who are caught in difficult and painful situations they accept it as the lord's will if a sick dies fighting his faith intact and his heart full of love for his lord but they consider it a calamity if a sick gives up his faith and acts in a cowardly manner I love listening to Jaswant when he relates incidents about Punjab. You must also find some time to listen to him. You will find the experience most enjoyable. Just then Jaswant came and sat down near them. Aga Khan says, "Welcome, my very dear and close friend." Jaswant says, "I am so grateful and happy that we share the same roots. In his infinite mercy, Vaheguru looks after his own." Aga Khan says, For 17 years I have lived in an alien culture not knowing the greatness of my own but the moment I learned my true identity my blood boiled if amma had not stopped me i would have cut off the head of my mother's killer and offered it at my real father's feet and won his commendation tell me just one thing ji won't my father blame me for not avenging my mother's death just one says No Shatrujit Singh ji will never do that. Six do not enjoy spilling blood needlessly. When they see when they see the weak and innocent being tortured and killed, only then they pick up their swords. They are basically fakirs, <clears throat> but with courage and determination in their hearts. <clears throat> they go to war to protect the people from the cruelty of the tyrants. It is this love for humanity that makes them fight. They have no desire to enrich themselves with the spoils of war. They want to see their country free from the yoke of foreign rule, and this is what gives them grit, determination, and true resolve. It is selfless love which makes the Sikhs first try to change the thinking of the people in power. When they are met with stubbornness and willful destruction, they put up a strong resistance when all else fails they resort to weapons but this too is done not with hatred but with love in their hearts that is why their battles do not end in needless massacres since the time of banda bahadur sikhs have been ruthlessly attacked and mercilessly butchered a number of times yet they are not afraid but are always ready to fight the massacres of sikhs by Mir Mannu were the most horrific and horrifying at that time a couplet most often recited by the sikhs was as such mannu saadi datri asi mannu de soe jyo jyo soe vadiye dun swaye hoye meaning mannu is our sith and we the grass the more he cuts us down the more our numbers increase your mother was truly a noble soul soul she forgave her killer and in doing so she went to meet her lord with a clean heart full of love she was brave to the end giving up her life but not her faith and left you a legacy of love and dedication to your pant <clears throat> Aga Khan says I am finding it very difficult to understand these high ideals for me the need to take revenge is of more foremost importance just one says and that is because of the upbringing you have had for 17 years Aga Khan says yes I have learned two lessons extremely well loyalty and revenge just one says laughing loyalty is good and these people have it because of their love for their community indians on the other hand are too self-centered this causes them to lead narrow lives and suffer the consequences 
Sikhs exhibit exceptional loyalty because their love is based on high ideals. They feel no enmity towards anyone. They seldom show any meanness of thought or action. Aga Khan says, 17 years have gone by and yet my community has not given up on me. What kind of love is this? But tell me, will they now accept me? Jaswan says, wholeheartedly. Aga Khan says, will they interact with me? Jaswan says, why not? The joy they will feel on seeing you will have to be seen to be believed. When they hear that the moment you learned about your true identity, you did not take a moment to give up the wealth and comfort of your royal life, to revert to the panth. Cries of Tan Kalgiyunwale will echo all around. To the panth, this will be a confirmation that the blood of Sikhs is pure and does not come under any worldly influence. Chapter 24 At every opportunity, Aga Khan sought out Jaswan Singh to hear more about the valor, bravery, selfness, selflessness and humility of the Sikhs. The more he heard, the more eager he became to join his brothers. At one of the caravan's halts, Aga Khan noticed some people sitting under a tree. Walking up to them, he saw that they were six. One of them sat alone with a hang dog look, while the rest discussed something among themselves. They were not Punjabi six, but belonged to that region. Aga Khan asked them what, what the problem was. One of them said, this man has gone against our religious codes and abused another Sikh. He has also plotted with a Pathan to beat up the, his Sikh brother. Aga Khan said, it's a quarrel between these two men. Why don't you let them sort it out between themselves? The Jathidar said, Khan Sahib, we are Sikhs. Our beliefs and ways are quite unique. We all are brothers, and if there is any misunderstanding among us, we go to the Gurdwara and clear it up. We are forbidden to fight among ourselves. In fact, anyone found doing so is liable to punishment and is declared a tankhaya. No Sikh is allowed to criticize another Sikh behind his back, and that too to a non-Sikh. Never. All disputes are to be settled amicably within the family or in the Gurdwara, where the Granthi Singh acts as an arbiter. Aga Khan says, all this sounds very complicated. Are you all able to abide by this rule? Chathidar says, very much so. We are all members of one family. If we don't love each other, what sort of family are we? Our Guru has clearly stated, a Sikh may not abuse another Sikh. A Sikh may not criticize another Sikh. A Sikh may not conspire with another Sikh or non-Sikh to cause harm to a fellow Sikh. If we do not follow these rules, then we cannot be brothers. And if brothers harbor enmity towards each other, they will fight and kill each other. We must maintain unity among ourselves with love and trust so as to be able to face our enemies. We are all human and it is but natural for differences to arise. We are advised to overlook the other person's wrongdoings or try and reform him and not to expose him to public ridicule. This brother has committed a serious wrong and so a whole group had to sit on judgment. Aga Khan says, what have you decided? Chathidar says, he has confessed. The punishment awarded to him is to offer one rupee and twenty-five pesa in Guru's Golak and to recite Japji Sahib five times. Then he must organize a meal at his house for Sikhs and personally invite the person he has wronged. They must all sit together and eat. Please don't be offended, Khan Sahib, but this is the way our community is. We do not solve our problems by involving outsiders, however close or friendly they may be. Aga Khan was greatly impressed by this and related the whole incident to Sain and Jaswant when he returned to the camp. Finally, the caravan reached Peshawar. <clears throat> While the tra travelers camp made camp, Aga Khan stayed as an honored guest with the Khan of Peshawar. A retain, return 
cavalcade of travelers to Kabul was ready, and Aga Khan was to accompany it back. On the banks of a river, Aga Khan, Sain, and Jaswan Singh met to plan how they could reach Punjab quickly and safely. Aga Khan told them that he had already sent off the Kabul caravan with his assistant in charge. He had handed over the money and rations to him with the assurance that he would catch up with them in a few days. When Jaswan Singh heard this, he said, Khan Sahib, the lie you have used may be good sensed from a worldly point of view, but it is unacceptable as Sikhs base all their strategies on truth. Aga Khan says, My dear brother, when an enemy is full of wild lies and treachery, shouldn't we use the same means to outwit him? Jaswan Singh says, During my exile, the saintly person who helped me in Kabul told me, A Sikh does not tread the path of falsehood. His very existence is based on remembering his Creator, and he who lives in the presence of his Lord cannot act falsely. A liar can never be of service to his community. Lies become prevalent when self-centered people get together to fulfill their selfish motives. They use all kinds of deceitful tricks to defeat a common enemy. But in so doing, this becomes deeply rooted in their nature, leading to mutual distrust and auspicious and suspicionness. Gurbani says, Har name ke hove jodi <clears throat> Har name ke jove jodi which means to become together in the Lord's name. Real unity is among Gurmukhs who believe in the Lord's name and hence there is no place for suspicion and enmity. Chapter 25 At the break of dawn the next day, a group of people left Peshawar. These were Aga Khan, Sain, Jaswan Singh and Baba Ladha Singh with his trusted servant. They were all dressed as Pothari Muslims, as that would draw the least attention from their enemies. All were on horseback, while a couple of mules brought up the rear with their luggage. The route led them through some of the most picturesque countryside. This land had seen many ups and downs. It was ruled by powerful Aryan kings in the past and was known as Gadhar, Gandhar. Later, Akbar renamed it as Peshawar after King Porus. Chinese travelers who came here a century and a half ago also referred it, to it as Parshpura. Hindu religion was dominant and one of the great scholars, Panini, was born here. Later, the people turned to Buddhism and this, this area became the center of its learning and culture. Various monu monuments and Edifices of Buddhist articulture, architecture were built. Gandhar became famous for its fruits, flowers, forests and springs of fresh water. The land is still arable, but all the natural beauty has long gone. Mahmud Ghaznavi laid the whole area to waste. The, the artistically designed Buddha Vihars and stupas were turned to rubble. In time, all traces of Hindu and Buddhist culture vanished. This became the entire point, entry point for the foreign invaders to India, who looted and pillaged, leaving behind ruins and destruction. The party from Peshawar followed this route, their horses carefully picking their way among the stones and rocks. They little realized how many centuries of history lay underfoot. As they neared the banks of the Indus, they spotted a group of Sikhs at a distance and heard the sounds of singing. Just one Singh suggested that they stop there and get some rest. While he sent one of the attendants to find out what was happening, soon the boy returned and reported, It's a group of Sikh men and women. They have prepared Kada Prashad and are singing Kirtan. Just one Singh wanted Aga Khan to experience a Sikh Samagam. So they both dressed in Sikh garments and joined the group accepting them as six Sings and Jathadari six, The group respectively welcomed them. After completing the Kirtan, the leader recited the Ardas, which was for the soul of a young girl who had died at this very spot. 
During a raid by the Mughals, a group of Hindu men and women had been captured. Um, among them was a Sikh girl. During the journey, she constantly urged the others to resist the invaders and not meekly follow them like a herd of cattle. They were being taken to a life of slavery, which was worse than death. To die fighting for one's freedom was far better. Her words often led to skirmishes between the soldiers and their victims, and many were wounded and killed. When the Mughals learned that the one instigating the rebellion was a sick girl, they began to treat her more harshly, finally tying up her hands and feet. On the banks of Indus, where they made camp, they decided to convert her to Islam. The Qazi got ready, but the fearless girl refused. Ultimately, they lost patience and threw her into the river, and thus this brave soul was liberated from all sufferings and went free and happy to meet her lord. The news soon spread to all the Sikhs who lived in the region. They could not find her body, but they made prashad and said a prayer for her soul. Since then, this was repeated every year. Later, they were able to trace her to a Sikh family of Garthal. Her father had become a Singh after taking Amrit. He was killed fighting in a battle. Some Pathans of the area had told them that they had heard her say to her companions, If you can do nothing else, then jump into the river. On the way there will be plenty of opportunities, as we will cross seven rivers, Satluj, Bias, Ravi, Janab, Jhelum, Indus, and Lunda. Aga Khan listened to all this, his throat tight with emotion. His thoughts went back to his mother and her imprisonment, and automatically his hands tightened on his sword. Waves of emotion washed over him, ultimately bringing tears to his eyes. O oh Lord, he thought, creator of such a courageous people, and yet what warm feelings they have for each other. They had never seen this girl, knew nothing about her except that she died to keep her faith intact, and yet they meet every year, sing Kirtan and pray for her. What an example of love and devotion. More than that of any family, I am grateful that this sacred blood flows in my veins too, and it has brought me close to my own people and to Sikhi. Aga Khan accepted the Kada Prashad with thankfulness. His first attendance at a Sikh Magam proved spiritually uplifting for him. The warmth of their acceptance of him gave him immense joy. Especially when they heard from Jaswan Singh a brief account of the difficult journey from Kabul. Chapter 26 In the olden days, there used to be another tower called Toshe Kane Da Bunga in the open land between the main gate of Shri Darbar Singh Sahib and the Akal Bunga. The central enclosed space thus became very useful for holding secret meetings like that of the Gurmatas in strict privacy. The entrances to this place were carefully guarded. A secret code word decided by the Jathidar of the Akal Bunga was conveyed to those who were invited to attend. The Akal Bunga was established by the sixth Guru, Sri Guru Hargobind, and along with this laid the foundation of the Akali ethos. An Akali was a, one who had complete faith in the Akal Purak, and whose mainstay in life was Gurbani and Nam Simran. He had no worldly attachments, not to people nor to things. To the Akali, the Panth was of supreme importance, and he worked for maintaining the Sikh Maryada and character, as well as to serve the poor and the needy. The Akali was a fearless warrior, and when needed, was ready to sacrifice his life. He was pure of character, in fact an epitome of all qualities which Guru Sahiban wanted their Sikhs to have. He was detached from the world, yet not a sannyasi, because he lived in society to serve it. The Akali wore blue colored garments, a tradition which began at the time of the first Amrit Prachar. Iyo Upaje Singh Pajgyo Nilambhar Tara Meaning, this is how the blue robe tradition of warrior six came into being. Different Jathas of Guru Gobind Singh's army wore different uniforms and supported particular colors. 
blue color worn by Sahib Zada Fateh Singh soldiers subsequently became the traditional symbol of both Akali and Nihang Singhs. It was also the duty of the Akalis and Nihang Singhs to call the Gurmata meetings in times of danger to the Panth. Gurmata was the supreme force for unifying the Panth. The Akalis of the Akal Bunga would send messages to all Jathedars, responsible leaders, Granthi Singhs and respected Sikh scholars to come on a particular day. When all had gathered, the entry points were sealed. In the open space, a divan was arranged, and after the kirtan and ardas, a hukam was read out and prashad distributed. A solemn oath was sworn by each and every person present there that he had to come to discuss only matters of the panth and would take decisions for the welfare of the panth. No personal problems or prejudice prejudices would color his decision. After this, the Jathedar would say Ardas, and the matter in hand would be taken up. As the problem was finally resolved, the Jathedar would announce the decision, and the congregation would disperse. Then it was the Akali's job to convey the decision to the world panth, to the whole panth, and see that everyone adhered to it. Because of the deep respect and reverence the Akalis commanded, everyone bowed to their wishes. It was unheard of that anyone went against the Gurmata. The tradition of the Gurmata began in Chamkor, and during those perilous days, Guru Gobind Singh himself taught the Singhs the complete procedure of holding the Gurmata. After Sri Guru Gobind Singh, the first Gurmata of the Panth was held with Baba Santok Singh as the Jathidar at Hazur Sahib, and the last one was held during the Battle of Nushera under the ages of Maharaja Ranjit Singh and Baba Fula Singh Akali. After the Sikhs lost their kingdom, the Panth seemed to go into a state of shock, self-centeredness and lowly acts from which Satguruji had uplifted the Sikhs again became prominent. Under the leadership of the Singh Sabha, the Panth seemed to awaken to its glory, lost glory. But the Western influence brought about some changes and the original meaning of Gurmata changed to mean merely a resolution and its narrow and restricted connotations. A resolution can be termed as a Mata or a majority view, but not a Gurmata, which stood for Panthic unity, purity, a higher aim, and was based on norm and sacrifice. This was a sacred tradition in which selfishness, partisanship, envy, and working of one's own progress by fair means or foul had no place. Gurmata stood for uplifted and pure minds which had been washed of all selfish motives, thus cleansed of me and mine. This tradition worked solely for the benefit of the whole panth. Chapter 27 The small group of tra travellers from Kabul reached Amritsar. They were now dressed as the Khalsa. Emotions and thoughts churned in their hearts as they approached Shri Darbar Sahib. Standing in speechless wonder, they looked with awe at the splendour of the Golden Temple. Satwant Kaur, the young and innocent girl, abducted from the warm security of a loving family and sent into hostile territory, to face untold hardships and terrors, did not ever imagine that a day would come when she would be back in her homeland. Yet here she was, her heart filled with gratitude and love for Vahiguru, who had protected her and given her the courage to face her prosecutors bravely, and who in his infinite mercy had brought her safely back to her beloved country. Her eyes filled with tears, and with folded hands she bowed low, till her forehead touched the sacred ground and she became lost in a world of spiritual bliss. The old man Baba Ladda Singh had wished for a long time to have darshan of Shri Darbar Sahib before departing from this world, but the great distance and the arduous journey had made him think that his wish would remain unfulfilled. Now he lay in deep obstinance, with a heart too full for words. For Sain too, it was home, a homecoming. She was a Sikh and a devout follower of the teachings of the Guru Sahiban. 
the twists and turns of life had taken her to a foreign land and its alien faith, to carry out her duty to her beloved mistress and protect the young child left in her care, she had adopted the ways of the land. Now she stood in wonder at Wahiguru's ways that had brought her and her young charge safely here. She too was prostrated with a grateful heart. Aga Khan stood in awed silence at his soul, as his soul drank in the beauty and serenity of the temple. He felt a deep stirring of emotion which had been aroused by Sain, telling him about his origins and the brave and upright Khalsa, of which he too was a member. He looked at the temple and the cool water of the Sarovar surrounding it, and he wanted to lose himself in its embrace. His hands came up in the only way of prayer he knew, and then he too was bowing and offering his soul in total surrender. All four lay vismad must, lost in a spiritual joy so deep as to be bordering on the unconscious, a joy which can be experienced, not expressed. When all thoughts halt, the outer world recedes and there is only the soul and Vahigru's presence. A long time passed, then they got up and sat down on the edge of the sarovar. Just then, a Singh Sahib approached and was joyfully recognized by Satwant as the Santiji who had guided and comforted her in Kabul. He had stayed back to help some Sikhs who were still imprisoned there. He had managed to reach Punjab much ahead of them as he had received a message that his presence was urgently required for a Gurmata. He was remarkable. It was remarkable how the untrained soldiers had established a strong and secret network of communication so that even without the benefit of trains, mail, wireless services, they could send messages to far-flung places like Afghanistan. Santaji now took Satwant aside and heard all about their long journey. He was deeply moved when he learned that Aga Khan was none other than the missing son of Shatrujit Singh. His eyes filled with tears as his heart echoed with Tan Guru Nanak, Kalgiyamwale Padshah, Tu Tan. Santaji was ecstatic, but well-read and a master of many languages. Whenever the Panth was in difficulties, he would leave his peaceful world and a great, at great personal risk rush to help. Often he would leave his long hair open and thus he came to be known as Bauriyawala Wale Babaji. The Sikhs were not the only ones to revere him because of his frequent trips to the northern states of Baluchistan, Ghazni, Kandahar, Jalalabad, Khyber, etc. The Muslims of the area worshipped him as their peer. He had been on the lookout for Shatrujit Singh's missing family all these years and firmly believed that somewhere at least one of them was still alive. And now here was Satwant Kaur presenting his long lost son to the Panth. Taking all four of them with him, Santji headed for the Gurmata Divan. There were strong rumors of an invasion by Ahmad Shah and the Marathas had spread all over Punjab and were carrying out activities inimical to the Sikhs. So it was important for the leaders of the Khalsa to meet and plan a strategy to protect themselves against these powers. Santji told them the secret password for the day so they could enter without any hitch. The ardas for the completion of the Divan was about to begin when Santaji stood up and loudly saying Sat Sri Akal, he congratulated the Panth that the son of Shatrujit Singh was finally in their midst. The news electrified the congregation and cries of Bole So Nihal, Sat Sri Akal echoed and re-echoed. Then at Santaji's urging, Satwant stood up and related the whole story of her kidnapping, her days in Kabul, and finally her meeting with Aga Khan and the journey back home. As they listened, these strong, brave, tough men were moved by the same emotion. What magic had the Guru Sahiban wrought in the minds and hearts of ordinary mortals, that even their young daughters and sisters faced impossible odds with such fervor and fortitude. The whole area echoed with passionate cries of Tan Sikhi, Tan Sikhi, Tan Kalgiyanwale Pita. It was he who had given the gift of eternal life to the Khalsa. 
it was he who had sacrificed his four sons for an ideal and then proclaimed, What does it matter if four sons have attained martyrdom? I have lakhs of sons in the Khalsa. This ideal son will live for all time to come. Yes, and it was this flame of Sikhi that burned bright, steadily and eternal in the heart of every Sikh. Aga Khan now stood up and greeted the gathering with folded hands. He had managed to pick up some words of Punjabi, and so slowly but clearly he said, Vaheguru Ji ka Khalsa, Vaheguru Ji ki Fateh. I offer my head at the feet of the Guru Khalsa. The End